Good morning, church. How are you doing this morning? Good. Well, would you stand with us as we worship the Lord our God? You are peace when my fear is 
Join me in prayer. Oh, Lord Jesus, what a joy it is uh, to sing your praises. Uh, Lord, we can do it as soon as we wake up each day. We can sing your praises each day from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same. Uh, Lord, we gather with your people. We lift up your name together now. But, Lord, we thank you that we will sing your praises forever. For you forever reign. 
We give you our thanks and our praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take a moment before you're seated. Please turn around, introduce yourself, welcome those around you in the sanctuary. Well, good morning and welcome once again. I'm Pastor Ray. We're so glad that uh, you've joined us for worship today. And if today's your first day here with us on a Sunday morning, we extend a very special uh, welcome to you. We're glad God brought you uh, here with us today. We trust he's going to speak to you uh, through this service as well. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask everyone, there's this green registration pad. You'll probably see it sitting on one side or the other. It's usually on the inside aisle. If you're sitting next to it, would you mind grabbing hold of that and just signing your name in and passing it down to the next person? This way we can have a record of each one's attendance with us uh, this morning. Uh, while you're doing that, let me just share a few brief announcements with you. Uh, today is our first day of evangelism training, and a number of you have already signed up for that, uh, but it's not too late. You can sign up or just, or just come at 4 o'clock, but we're meeting this Sunday and next Sunday, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., food provided. Uh, for evangelism training. So part one this week, part two next week. And uh, so we encourage everyone to come out for that. Uh, Kristen North, our uh, deacon of missions, and uh, our missionary to Youth for Christ will be leading uh, most of that training for us. And then in a couple of weeks, as we uh, approach the end of October, we've got a lot of things happening that final weekend. Uh, Saturday morning, the 28th, is our men's breakfast at 8 a.m., all men in the church invited. Little after that, same day, 10 a.m. is the health fair, and uh, there's an, an insert in your worship guide, Forever Young Passport to Senior Health, tells you all about the health fair and what's going to go on there. And I notice uh, people are signing up for that as well, which is great. And then uh, a little bit after that, we'll be having our trunk or treat, uh, the same day in the afternoon. Uh, but right now, we're gathering candy for that. This is candy donation month, so we've just got a couple weeks to bring those candy donations in. We get a lot of kids from the community out for this. It's a wonderful uh, way to reach out to the community and share with them uh, about our church while also just giving a, a fun, wholesome activity for the kids. So uh, if you can bring some candy in or sign up to uh, be a trunk. We need 30 or 40 cars out there. All you do is open your trunk, put some decorations up, pass out candy to kids. It couldn't be a funner, easier time. And then two weeks from today will be our pastor appreciation potluck. It's the fifth Sunday. We always do a potluck anyways. And so we're going to combine that with a pastor appreciation Sunday. Uh, there's some uh, flyers for that uh, out in the foyer. We'll put those in the worship guide for you next week. But you can pick up one this week as well if you like. Uh, that's all of our announcements. So if you'll please take your Bibles and turn to our scripture reading uh, for this morning. It comes from the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. You'll find that on page 1035 in your pew Bibles. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10, the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one, one of you had a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. He goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, search it carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. 
In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God when one sinner who repents. It's the word of God. never fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay in my head I will sing of the goodness of God all my you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness of God I love your through the fire in darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God oh oh my you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness of God It's running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. It's running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me.
Amen. Well, this week, our missionary prayer focus is Youth for Christ. And I could sit here and tell you all about Youth for Christ, but we've got something better. We have our Broward Director of Youth for Christ with us, Kristen North. And she's going to be sharing with you just a bit about the ministry and about an initiative, a special initiative they have uh, this week happening. So, Kristen, welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Our church was the first one to adopt us as missionaries in Broward and send us out. Thank you so much. Because of your constant prayers, your financial support, last year we were able to work with over 1,600 kids in Broward County. And we, uh, it's just so exciting to, to be able to share with you that we are in the Broward Detention Center, we are in alternative schools for kids who have been expelled from the public school system, and we're in regular schools, and we're regularly finding those who are isolated, those who are suffering from anxiety, depression, they don't know how to create a community, they don't know how to connect, and they're coming, and it's so exciting. So this week, we're having a special week that we call Youth Matter. This is where we're asking all of us as adults, uh, people in the Christian community, go out, find a young person, and let them know that they matter to you. It could be writing a note, sending a text, it could be a, a social media post, whatever it is, but just tell a kid that they matter. Um, and I'm going to show you a short video. These are our kids from our programs and some of our uh, missionaries. I know I'm not in this video. Sorry. Next time I will be. But um, here's just a few of our kids talking from their own perspective about what Youth for Christ has meant to them and what it means to have an adult out there just saying that you matter and I believe in you. So thank you so much. Youth for Christ helped me realize that I was born for a reason. They believe in me and they help me see my potential. They try to benefit me and in any way possible, whether that's even telling me the hard things sometimes. Uh, sometimes I need to hear that. Don't get me wrong, I love the games. I love the camp and I love the events. But my favorite parts had to be when they're genuinely sitting down and helping me and talking to me. It's not just fun or a program, it's a family. It's hard to know who's real or not, but at Youth for Christ, they showed me that Jesus is real. Whenever I need guidance, I can go to them and I can express myself and, and just be there and they'll be there for me. Youth for Christ made me feel like I matter. They helped me tap into the best part of myself. I feel safe, I feel happy when I'm here. Before I had catalyst before I had met them when they were in my middle school. I was very lost in my path with the Lord. I didn't, I was starting to not believe that, you know, there could be a God. And I was very self-conscious about a lot of things. Still am, but very much less than I was before. It helped me have a sense of worth. I didn't feel alone anymore. The reason why I think I matter is because Jesus Christ gave me a second chance. Not only just for me, for my family. Youth for Christ, they gave me a place to be myself. They presented the gospel to me and then kind of stepped back and let me be my own person. Gave me the space to be my own person, to explore God for myself and to build that sort of individuality. Youth for Christ helped me see that I'm a new creation. I know I have worth. When I come inside this building, it makes me feel like I have a purpose. They believe in me and made me see my potential. Youth for Christ makes me feel like I matter. My name is Celeste and I matter. My name is Camila and I matter. The reason why these kids matter to me is because I was a kid raised in the streets and I needed somebody to tell me that I could be somebody. I needed somebody to tell me that I matter. I needed somebody to say that you matter. You, know, you, you work with these kids for a while and you start realizing how, how strong they actually are. Uh, going through all the things they go through and yet being able to have creative outlets and, and, and strive in their creativity and thrive in their creativity. Teenagers are our future. They are the future leaders, future change makers. They are our future. Every smile, every success, it shows us that we're on the right path. That's why this place matters. Kids come into this space, they're loved on, 
they're in authentic Christ-sharing relationships with adults in this space, and they learn that God loves them, and that they matter, and they matter to God, and they matter to us, and then they learn that they matter in this world. These kids are the future. These kids have worth. My name is Macrina Perez, and youth matter to me. My name is Ronnie Lillard, and I believe that youth matter. I'm Tia diaz Ballard, and youth matter to me. So if you want to learn more about Youth for Christ, our Kristen and part of her team will be in the, the table in the back on your way out, and you can learn more about the Youth Matter Initiative as well. Uh, basically, when you see teens around this week uh, in any place, just reach out to them and say, hey, you matter to me, you matter to our church, you matter to God, and, uh, and let them know how important they are uh, to, us, to us all. So let's go to the Lord together now in prayer as a family. Dear Lord, we thank you so much that, uh, that, that we matter to you, Lord. We mattered so much that you sent your son, uh, Jesus, to be our Savior, and we are so thankful for that. And, uh, Lord, I just thank you for this church family. I thank you for each person. And uh, Lord, as we lift up our church family to you now, uh, we want to pray for a number of people. We pray for those who've been in the hospitals this week. We pray for Phil Houston. Uh, uh, who's over at Tamarack Rehab now. We pray for Phil, Lord, as they uh, try to balance things out for him and as he begins his uh, recovery process. We pray for Fred Townsend, who was in the hospital this week, for Carl Kloppenberg. Uh, we continue to pray for v, v. Danielson and Jan Weatherby. Uh, Lord, we thank you that Irene Yurt was back with us today, and uh, we continue to pray for your healing for Irene as uh, she does physical therapy for her shoulder. Lord, we've been praying for Betty Brown's son with cancer. We received word this week that he is in full remission, and so we give you praise, God. Thank you for answered prayer. Uh, Lord, we thank you for our missionary prayer focus for Youth for Christ, for Kristen, for her team. We pray for Youth for Christ right here in Broward County. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you would be with them as they continue reaching out to youth and uh, that you would uh, use them and, and strengthen them for the task, provide everything they need. We pray that many... Uh, young people would come to know you, Lord, and find the hope that they can have in Christ. Uh, Lord, we uh, do look around the world, and uh, uh, we see all that's happening in the Middle East. We continue to pray, Lord, uh, for your intervention. We, we pray for Israel, Lord. We pray for those who've lost loved ones. We pray for those who are separated from loved ones. We pray for hostages, that you would protect them, and that they would be freed. And uh, Lord, ultimately, we just continue to pray for peace in the Middle East. But Lord, uh, we just pray concerning this conflict at this time. And so, Lord, uh, we lift all of these things to you, knowing that you are good, that you are God, that you are sovereign. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, usually uh, it's my privilege to open the Word of God to you at this time. Uh, but today I get the privilege of sitting down and receiving the Word of God from someone else. Uh, pastor Sean Northcraft, many of you have met him, uh, is a, a new pastor on staff at our church. He started two weeks ago. He's our new youth pastor. And so he's already been ministering to our youth for uh, a number of weeks. But I, I wanted you to be able to hear from him this morning as well, just so you could get to know him a little bit better, hear this uh, man's heart for God and his word, and, uh, and to give uh, Pastor Sean an opportunity to share God's word with us today too. So Pastor Sean, welcome to the pulpit. Good morning. So we are going to pick up where we left off in the scripture reading for today. So if you have your Bibles, please uh, open them back up to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. I know that we have our technology, we have our phones, we have our iPads and whatnot, but I always enjoy the sound of Everyone flipping the pages. Kind of sounds like, the, like a fireplace with the paper. Before I begin, please uh, join me in prayer. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity um, that you've given me this morning to serve your people, to serve your church uh, through leading them in the teaching of your word. And with that, Lord, I know it comes uh, great responsibility you say in your word that not, not everyone should uh, seek to teach. For those who teach the word of God will be judged with a stricter judgment, Lord. And for that, I pray that you 
you guard the words of my mouth so that way they, they honor your word, Lord, and, uh, and edify your church and, and save the lost, Lord. I pray that you open up the hearts and minds of everyone who's here this morning, that they may receive what you have for them. We thank you for your faithfulness, and we thank you that you always meet us where we are and take us where you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So the, the scripture reading for this morning was Luke 15, 1 through 10. And the reason why I wanted to do that was because I wanted to set up the background context for you guys. So we see that Jesus is speaking to a crowd. And within that crowd, it is made up of sinners and tax collectors. And then also the scribes and the Pharisees, or the the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. And the Pharisees come against Jesus, and they say, this man welcomes tax collectors and sinners and even eats with them. I always... I always found it interesting when I was a teenager why they mentioned eating with them. It's because, as I'm sure we have experienced, eating is eating together is intimate. You know, it's a time we come together with friends and family and we share about our days and we associate with one another and we come together in fellowship. So the scribes and Pharisees are coming against Jesus because he is fellowshipping with these people. So now that you have the, the background context of what's going on, in response to this, Jesus gives these three parables. First was the shepherd and the lost sheep, the woman and the lost coin, and then what we will be going over this morning has come to be known as the parable of the prodigal son. Parable of the prodigal son. However, I don't really like that title because when you start reading in verse 11, Jesus starts off by saying, a man had two sons. That's how he starts the parable. A man had two sons. Hence the title for today, A Tale of Two Sons. Let's start off in verse 11. And he, Jesus, said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Let's pause there. I want to point out a couple of things within these verses because it's packed with so much. And remember, Jesus is saying this parable to a group of mixed people, two opposing sides. And he is giving this parable, and he's pulling out a reaction from this audience. The younger son said to the father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. Give me my share. In that time, in that culture, that was equivalent for the son to tell the father, I wish you were dead. Give me what's owed to me. I wish you were dead. Give me what's mine. And then he goes on to say that not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. Jesus is using symbolism here. And within this context, far country represented Gentiles. Gentiles were non-Jews. Gentiles were the people that were excluded from the covenant people of God. So Jesus is using the symbolism saying, This man wished his father was dead practically, took his inheritance, left his identity, left his people, and went to a faraway country, to the Gentiles. And not only that, but he divided his property between them. 
excuse me, and not only that, but he squandered his property with reckless living. There in the Greek, the Greek for reckless means wasteful. He lived a wasteful life. He, he wasted his inheritance. And it speaks to immorality. It speaks to immorality. And we'll see what that means later on when the, young, the older son has something to say about it. So not only did he say he wanted his inheritance, he went off, he left, a, he left behind his Jewish identity, he went to a faraway country with the Gentiles, and he squandered his inheritance. A famine came, wiped everything out, he had nothing, and so what did he do? He hired himself out to a Gentile. So you can imagine the audience, the scribes and the Pharisees are like, yes, yes. This guy's getting everything that's coming to him. He deserves what's happening to him. So he hires himself out to a Gentile. He becomes a slave to a Gentile. And not only that, once he get, becomes a slave to the Gentile, that Gentile puts him with the pigs. Why is that significant? Because pigs, swine, was considered to be unclean to the Jews. So he left behind his father, his identity, his people, went to a people that were not his people, became a slave to those people, and became unclean. And not only that, he was starving. No one would help him. No one would give him anything to eat. He was so hungry that he wanted to eat what the pigs were eating. Imagine, imagine He's on his hands and knees with the pigs wanting to eat the pods that they were eating. He has hit the lowest of lows within this Jewish context, in the Jewish culture. He's hit the lowest of lows. Let's pick up on verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I Perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose, excuse me, and he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion, ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, notice that he doesn't even get to finish what he rehearsed to say. The father doesn't give him a chance. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Let's pause there. It says that he came to himself. What does that mean? It's a note of humility it's a note of humility, and we can hear it in his rehearsed speech. He acknowledged his insult without minimizing it, without justifying it, and without shifting blame. He didn't pass the buck. He didn't say, I'm this way because of such and such. He took ownership. He took responsibility. He recognized the consequences he demonstrated maturity, responsibility, humility, and compassion for those he had harmed. This is a sign of repentance. He says, treat me as a hired servant. I am no longer, no longer worthy to be called your son. In that culture, in that time, it was custom, it was allowed that in these circumstances, 
the family would have a funeral for this child. He left, they had a funeral, they mourned the loss of their child. So he says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, to be your son, take me as a hired servant. This would have been best case scenario for this younger son, being taken as a hired servant. Restitution to be made in order to pay back what he wasted with the possibility to be reconciled to his father. Best case scenario. Best case scenario. There needed to be restitution, payback for what he wasted. The Pharisees would have agreed with this. The Pharisees definitely would have agreed. The son would need to confess, repent, be humiliated, shamed, and maybe, maybe, receive forgiveness and mercy only after full restitution. Only after full restitution. He needed to earn his way back. This is how the Pharisees and the scribes would have seen it. Worst case scenario. Now that's best case. Worst case scenario, the son would be stoned to death. The son would have been stoned to death in accordance with the command in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 18 through 21. I'll read it for you. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city, of his city at the gate of the place where he lives. And they shall say to the elders of the city, this is our son, is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death. All the men of the city shall stone him to death. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. This is worst case scenario. The younger son, ready to go back home, doesn't know what's waiting for him. And you can, you can feel the audience, especially the scribes and the Pharisees. Yeah, let's see what happens. Let's see what Jesus is going to say. I'm liking this. They weren't too happy. Because the exact opposite happened. The exact opposite happened. What does it say? He arose and he went back to his home. And what happens? It says that the father saw him in a distance. What does that tell us? The father was looking for him. The father was keeping an eye out for his son. Just as the good shepherd left the 99 to seek the one, and the woman sought after the coin, so too the father was searching after his son was searching after his son. But not only that, what does it say? It says, once he, the father saw him, he ran to him, ran to him, embraced him, kissed him. The Greek there for embracing and kissing literally means that he fell upon his neck. He fell upon his neck and kissed him. And he went from that and he said, bring the best robe, bring the ring, bring the sandals. I want to point out something to you. Men in that time, in that culture, especially man, a man of this stature of the father, did not run. They didn't run. Why? Because it was shameful for them to run. They would have to lift their cloak most likely exposing the knee. Anything above the shin and exposing the knee would bring shame upon him. Are you getting that? The shame and the condemnation 
that was meant for the son, the father took upon himself when he ran to him. The son would have come to the city gates. Let's go. No. The father ran to his son and brought him. The father ran to his son and brought on the shame met for the son upon himself and embraced him and kissed him. Why the best robe? Why the ring? Why the sandals? There's great significance for each of them. The best robe obviously would have belonged to the father. It was the father's robe. The robe signified the identity of the patriarch. The father was the patriarch of the family. And this is what the robe symbolized. So the father restored the identity of his son. The father restored the identity of his son. Second, the ring. This would have been a signet ring. In some cultures, a signet ring would have the coat of arms of the family. This would, this would symbolize that his privileges, his rights, and his authority was restored. So not only was his identity restored, the privileges, the rights, and the authority of the father was, was restored in the son, was imputed to the son, just as Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. And the sandals. What's up with the sandals? The sandals signified provision. It signified the provision of the father and full restoration to sonship. Full restoration to sonship. And then he says, bring the fatted calf. Let's celebrate. Why? Because my son was dead. He's now alive. He was lost and he is found. That verbiage, those words, resonates with Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Paul says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Remember, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to the people within the church. He says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived. We all once lived. Paul includes himself in there. All once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, thank God for the buts in the Bible. Thank God for buts in the Bible, because Paul's about to change the story. He says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, what? made us alive, but God made us alive. Together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Just as the father of the younger son, get this, the son was dead, but it was the father that restored him to life. It was the father's prerogative to restore the son. The son was alive because of what the father had done for him, just as what God has done for us. We were dead in our sins and trespasses, but God made us alive. God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we've been saved and raised up with him and seated. It doesn't, it doesn't say we will be raised up and seated. Paul's saying this is present. If you are in Christ, you are raised up and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as we have been raised up in and with Christ, this is what the father did with the son, the younger son. He raised him up. So we see the correlation here. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. It is a gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. 
If you can earn grace, it ceases to be grace. Grace cannot be earned. It can only be given. It is a gift. Let's pick up on verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. Get that. He has received him. He didn't reject him. He received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. You can just feel the resentment from this older son. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out. There it is. Just as the father pursued the younger son, now you see the father pursuing the older son. The older son. Are you starting to notice there wasn't one rebel? There was two rebels under one roof. A man had two sons. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, look. These many years I have served you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, there's that reckless living, with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and he is found. Clearly, the older son represents the self-righteous, legalistic attitude Jesus was combating regarding the Pharisees and the scribes within his audience. The younger son represented the tax collectors and the sinners, and the older son represented the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus is calling them out in this parable. He says, oh, you got this to say about me. Listen to what I have to say about you. The older son was alienated from his father. Alienation does not consist only of physical distance. It consists of relational estrangement. See, we tend to think that the younger son, the prodigal son, was the one that was alienated from his father. The older son was just as alienated from his father. This is evident by the fact that he keeps his distance from the house of his father, remotely inquiring about the celebration. So he's been working in the field. He comes and he hears the music. And let's put it in our, in our, in our time. He, he hears the music. He sees the lights. He hears people, you know, having a good time. He smells the good food. And he says to the servant, come here. What's going on? What's happening? And then when he goes on to address his father, he says, when this son of yours, he says, when this son of yours, those words that he is saying to the father testifies that he refuses to acknowledge that he belongs to the same family that has received back his brother. So he is estranged relationally from his father these words testify that he refuses to acknowledge that he belongs to this family. Regarding his relationship to his family, he was metaphorically, as well as literally, far away in the field. Physically and metaphorically, far away in the field. He failed to love his father with all his being, and his neighbor, in this case his younger brother, as himself. He failed to 
fulfill what Jesus teaches. And not only that, but Jesus teaches us in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. He says, you've been taught to hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you and come against you. So the older brother fails to even fulfill this. The older son had managed to conceal his rebellion. He managed to conceal his rebellious, true feelings of resentment and festering hatred towards his father and his brother. He managed to conceal this. Get this. He had been just as wicked as his younger brother. He was just as wicked as his younger brother. Only difference was that the wickedness was inward, while his brother's was outward for all to see. We have some people like that in our life. Oh, man, look at that guy. Look at her. It's out there for everyone to see. But you know what? There's also those people that you don't see it. And this is the older brother. Notice how Jesus doesn't tell what happens at the end of the parable. It's a cliffhanger. It's literally a cliffhanger. Imagine everyone's there listening to Jesus. That's it? What happened? The older son came home. The father went out and treated him, begged him to come in. The older son gave his father a piece of his mind. And that's it? What happens? Kenneth Bailey, a a Presbyterian minister, was fluent in Arabic and specialized in Middle Eastern literature. He states that this parable uh, divides naturally into two equal and parallel parts. Naturally into two equal and parallel parts, systematically structured in a mirrored configuration. This, in fact, was typical of storytelling in the Middle East for easy memorization. All right, this was the norm. This is what Jesus was doing, so that way they could easily remember the parable. The first half, which was focused on the relationship between the younger son and the father, had eight stanzas. The first half had eight stanzas between the younger son and the father. But the relationship between the older son and the father only had seven stanzas. Therefore, incomplete. Cliffhanger. Cliffhanger. So, what happens? What happens? I'm sure we would like to think that the younger son said, you know what? You're right, Dad. You're right. I'm wrong. I'm happy. My brother's back home. Let's go in. Let's have a good time. Where's my brother at? But that's not what happened. That's not what happened. Jesus knew the end of the story. Jesus knew the end of the story, and we know the end of the story because we have the scriptures. The younger son represented, remember, the audience who Jesus was speaking to. The younger son represented the tax collectors and the sinners. The older son was a representation of the scribes and the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. Again, we know what happens, and Jesus knew the ending too. The older son murders the father. The older son murders the father, just as the scribes and the Pharisees had Jesus murdered. Just as the scribes and the Pharisees had Jesus murdered. Just as Jesus Christ died for sinners to be forgiven and reconciled, so too the father died for the sake of reconciliation of his sons. It was the father that constantly pursued. It was the father that constantly restored at his own expense. 
just as Jesus pursues us. Just as Jesus in the scriptures we see constantly pursues, 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 leading to his own death. So in closing, the younger son, you may be here and see yourself in the younger son. You may be sitting here. I, I, I feel like I relate to the younger son. You've gone your own way. You've lived your own life without any regard for God. Given into the things of this world and indulged in your own lustful desires. Maybe you've even hit rock bottom due to these sinful acts of rebellion. That's you. I plead with you to repent, seek forgiveness, put your faith in Jesus Christ, and be reconciled to God. Some of you may be sitting here and you're saying to yourself, thinking to yourself, I'm relating to the older brother. You may be here and see yourself as the older brother. You grew up in church. Or you grew up in a religious home. Yet you still have no relationship with God. Your relationship with the Lord is estranged. Just as the older son was with his father. You may even judge others unworthy of God's grace. And feel like you're owed something. When God owes no one anything. God doesn't owe us a thing. If that's you this morning, I plead with you. Repent. Seek forgiveness. Put your faith in Jesus Christ and be reconciled to God. Why? Why am I asking you this? Why am I pleading with you? Because Paul says in Romans chapter 5, 6 through 11, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore, in light of what I have just said, we have now been justified by his blood. Justified means to have a right standing before God. It is a legal term used. You are in a courtroom. You are guilty. But God deems you innocent. You have been justified. How? By the blood of Christ. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. From the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we have been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, Paul just keeps adding on. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is what Christ has done for you. This is what God is doing for you and through you in Christ. And because of that, rejoice. Rejoice. For we have received reconciliation. We have received reconciliation. And I will close with this. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1, Paul says, If then you have been raised with Christ, if you have put your faith in Christ, you have been saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. Not on the things of this world. For you have died, and your life is hidden in Christ, with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life, appears, then you also will, will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, again, whenever you see the word therefore in the text, you should always look back to see why the therefore is therefore. Always look back to see why the therefore is therefore. Paul says, put to death, therefore, in light of what I have just said, 
Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion. Sounds familiar like the, older, the younger son. Passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Notice how Paul doesn't say, get your life right. Hey, first, put to death these things. Then you come to Christ. That's not what he says. That's what we tend to do. We tend to take the scripture and flip it on its head. But Paul says the exact opposite. He says, no, 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 no. If you've been raised with Christ, if you are in Christ because of what he has done for you and what he is doing in and through you, because he is faithful and he will see you to the end, because he who began a good work in you, I am confident, will bring it to completion. He says, because of this, therefore, put to death these things. Because of you being in Christ, because you have been restored and reconciled, put to death these things. Put to death these things. If you are in Christ, remember who you are and what he has done for you. And again, if you are not in Christ, I plead with you, repent, seek forgiveness, put your faith in Jesus Christ and be reconciled. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for, again, the opportunity to preach and and teach your words, to teach your scripture, Lord. We thank you for what you have done for us on the cross. Just as the Father took the shame upon himself, in pursuit of his son to restore him and to reconcile him. So too, Christ gave his life for us that we may be reconciled to you and restored. Lord, I pray that you continue to speak to the hearts and minds of those who are here this morning. We thank you for your faithfulness even at times when we are unfaithful. We thank you for constantly pursuing us like the good shepherd with the sheep. When you have gone astray, you pursue us, you find us, you put us on your shoulders, and you take us back. You bring us back to the fold, and we thank you for that. We give you all the honor, glory, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Pastor Sean, thank you so much for bringing us the word of God today. A faithful exposition of a beautiful parable. Thank you so much. Uh, If you need prayer today for anything, uh, uh, you can talk to uh, one of the pastors on the way out, or you can be looking for one of our leaders up front, uh, and we'd be glad to pray with you and for you. Uh, Let us stand together uh, as we uh, end in a, a song of praise. Lord, I need you. Let's sing it as a prayer to our God.
Jesus, you're my hope instead. Come on, sing this out. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. I want to fix my righteousness. Oh, God. Everything you need is found in God through his son, Jesus Christ. Go in God's grace and be blessed. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord.